Then what I would do is after that sales discovery call, I would uh, generally require a proposal review meeting. Um, I would schedule a proposal. I'd say something like, um, you know, Josh, thanks for downloading all that information. The next step in our process is I'd like to schedule a proposal review meeting. I bring up my calendar. I book it with you right there because I want the opportunity um, to um, sell my proposal. I don't want you asking questions by yourself. Mm. Um, I want you asking questions out loud with me on the Zoom so that I can answer them. Welcome to the Web Design Business Podcast with your host, Josh Hall, helping you build a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey, friends, so great to have you here in this episode because we're going to take a deep dive into proposals. Web design proposals, I've found, can be one of the trickiest parts of a web design business. And I think it's mainly because all web design projects are different. There's never a project, at least in my experience, that was exactly the same. So it can be really tricky to figure out what to put in your proposal, what the scope looks like, what the heck to charge, but you also don't want to overwhelm your client with a ton of information. But at the same time, you don't want to overlook any details. It's really important as far as the scope of the project. So for all those reasons and more, web design proposals can be very, very tricky. But I'm excited in this episode to help you out with that. And to take this into a deep dive even further, I'm really excited to bring somebody on who knows quite a lot about proposals and how to do them well. So well, in fact, that he ended up creating a proposal tool for web designers. This is Joe Ardesser. He is the CEO of smartpricingtable.com. Now, Joe has a really cool background because he was an agency owner that grew a small team in a small agency. And really the, the thing that he did well, among many things, but one of the things he did well was his itemized and productized proposal system. And because that served his agency so well, and he was able to scale with that, he ended up making a, a product, a tool out of it because he was looking for something that wasn't there. So he made something himself, just like all the best tools are created. So I was so excited to have him on because Joe has a really, really fresh perspective on proposals, how to make them fast, how to make them understandable for clients, how to use options and different optionality for upsells, how to give your client control on what they want to choose and how to potentially two to three X your proposals just by giving your clients options that may have been hidden in the past. And he really, really has some cool insight on this. So I'm excited to hear how this helps you make proposals fast. And I dare say, maybe even make them fun. Like this is, I'm really, I'm really pumped about this one. So without further ado, here is Joe. Our goal in this conversation is to help you make proposals faster and funner. You can check him out at smartpricingtable.com. And actually, I have a link with this tool now. I'm really excited to be affiliated with Joe and his team now. Uh, you can go to joshhall.co slash SPT if you would like to give them a trial that's short for Smart Pricing Table. All right. Speaking of pricing and proposals, here's Joe. Joe, welcome officially to the podcast, man. You before we hit record, you were just saying you feel comfortable here. You feel like we're uh, we're in like minded territory here. We're part of the same tribe. As a uh, what, were, you, were you exclusively WordPress with your agency yeah, about, of like over a, a decade? about halfway through, uh, maybe maybe four years in out of the twelve years I ran my agency, we were uh, we decided to make that switch. So, okay. So, so yeah, let's start there. Cause I know we're going to dive into proposals, which always fascinate me because it's a, uh, as you know, as a web designer agency, whether it's a, a full blown agency or as a freelancer, I imagine proposals are probably even more important as an agency. Cause it has to be dialed in like a process, right. um, but you have a really cool framework for this. I have my own ideas and what's worked for me. So I want to dive into that, but I would love to start with your agency and yeah, how long were you an agency owner? And, uh, well, we'll start there. What was it? What was the jettison of your agency story? Uh, I had, I had an agency for about 12 years and, uh, I, I won't get into the details, but I actually was going to be a freelancer, Josh. That was my plan. And I ended up getting some carpal tunnel pain that ended up affecting my entire body. And then I hired someone out of necessity and it was amazing. <laughs> Um, uh, like first for the first time ever, the mission was uh, going on without my, you know, needing a hundred percent on, 
Um, and so, so I started building an agency because of that affliction um, and ended up having about, about 12 people kind of at our peak. Wow. I didn't know anything about that. Was that due to anything with like the work you were doing, typing and using a mouse or was it unrelated? Uh, how did, do you know like how that happened? Essentially? Yeah. Well, you know, this is kind of interesting, a little tangent here, Josh, because a lot of people in our industry can have issues with like carpal tunnel or pain. Um, I actually, I found a book called the mind body disorder by Dr. Sarno, I believe. And uh, it was actually, it's really weird. I'm not into like a lot of like crazy theory stuff like this, but, but it was suppressing like just some pain from like years ago or something. And it manifested as physical, real physical pain. Um, mm. Reading the book fixed it. Um, I, I tell people all the time about, but it's the mind body prescription. So if you're, if you're at, okay. if you're at the keyboard and it's hurting, <laughs> <laughs> Might want to. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I'm going to link this in the show notes for sure. Yeah. So the mind body prescription or prescription. Yeah. <clears throat> interesting. And that, so do you feel uh, this is interesting because it, when it comes to agency and scaling, this is something where for any of my audience who are like dead set on being a one person show and a freelancer, I do always recommend like, you don't have to be a huge agency, but there may be a time in a season or a health issue where you might need some help. And I haven't talked to too many people who have experienced this, at least that I know of, but I have heard the stories of, of carpal tunnel and issues like that. In fact, I had a colleague of mine, a video editor who got one of those mouses that like uh, raised up his arm right. on the desk. So he wouldn't let it drag like that. Right. Um, and he's, cause he was having issues with it, with his fingers and stuff. And to this point, I better knock on some wood. I haven't had any issues, but it, it is something <laughs> that doesn't seem widely talked about at least. Yeah. So that's, that's really interesting that you were like made to like forced to scale. It sounded like early on. Yeah. The only coding I could do Josh was through a mic using dra dragon naturally speaking. And I was 10% wow. efficient. So, but it forced me to hire someone. And I think, you know, one of the things I would say is with business, I love learning. Sometimes you don't always have the biggest return on something uh, financially, but if you have an opportunity to grow, I think there's value in that itself. And I learned by hiring someone like, oh my goodness, I can, they, they get better over time. Um, I can start to delegate more and more. Um, and, uh, and now every little thing isn't dependent on me. Um, I, we're never a huge agency. We just, like I said, 10 people, but even like two or three, um, or even contractors, like leveraging other people, uh, can be a big way to, you know, make, make business a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, that's well said. That was my setup was just a few. We had about half a dozen like collaborators, essentially subcontractors. Some worked a lot and then some worked just as needed. And it was a great setup. I loved it. I didn't feel alone anymore. Really freed me up to start this brand of what I do now with teaching. And I couldn't have done it without subcontracting. So right. I'm a huge proponent of it. Actually, at the time of recording this, I'm working on my next course about scaling. So very, very top of mind. Um, but I, ha I don't want to stick on carpal tunnel too long because, but I have one more question sure. on that. And that is, did you do any, did you do anything physical to help the, with that? Or was it purely mindset, emotional, that kind of like, was it more, was it more headspace and mindset that helped that? Or did you do actually exercises or anything that helped? Well, just, just so you know, Josh, it, it started with my hands, but it ended up being everywhere. I had headaches. I couldn't sleep for more than like four hours a night. Cause I was so uncomfortable. And listen, all I did was read that book. It's wow. crazy. Um, now I have, I have found out just later in life that like when I work out, I feel a lot better and I, even like headaches and stuff will go away. So I'm a big proponent of working out, but for that particular thing, just read the book. So if you're struggling, check it out. Um, all right. Unintentionally uh, recommended the mind body prescription on this one for sure. So we'll make sure that's linked in the show notes. I'm glad to hear that worked out though, man. I mean, that's incredible. How we'll dive into proposals next year, but how long, just last question on that. How long was that process? Like, did you, did you start to feel better shortly after that? And, but you were already scaling, like, uh, I guess, when did you get back to form and were able to actually type in code? And I had a couple employees and, uh, 
while still struggling with the issue, when I finally found that book, there was, it was a couple of weeks uh, before I started noticing some significant changes. And within probably two months, I had 10% of the residual. So, okay. Gotcha. Wow. That's amazing, man. So I'm curious when you got to that point, did, had you already started hiring out and collaborating when the carpal tunnel stuff started happening or were you forced immediately to start hiring that, because of that? That forced me to. And, and it was, okay. it was scary. I, I, I never had a W2 employee. Uh, to me, it seemed very like that's a lot of risk. Um, I'd never really been a manager before. Um, but again, you, you get into it and you start seeing all the lessons that you're learning and the power of more than just you. And I ask that because the way your business is set up and proposals in particular is very, 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 very different. When like, I, I didn't start scaling until I had my proposal system pretty well locked in. I kind of capitalized on it as a freelancer and was able to replicate it. But what, what was your business like when you started scaling? Were, were you pretty organized? Did you have a lot of things in place or was it just a shit show and you're trying to figure it out? Like, what was it like when you started scaling? I think, you know, the technology and the systems made it a lot more enjoyable. Okay. So I think, you know, we, we, uh, I wouldn't say that the systems, uh, kind of, um, were the, the main thing that started us to grow. We just, I just kind of did that. We started getting more projects. We did it out of necessity. Um, but at a certain point, as you're growing an agency, whether that's two people, five, 10 people, you start to get this feeling of like being overwhelmed because there's so much stuff going around. Um, and that's when we, you know, really decided to, to double down and, um, explore, you know, how could we do proposals in a, a way that, um, like is effective, that doesn't take forever, that isn't like this ambiguous fog that's always hanging over us. Like, I just hated that so much. I said, I, I, there's got to be a better way. Were you doing the proposals when you started hiring or did you have like a project manager who was writing proposals and sending those out? What, yeah. What, what was your role when you started scaling? I did a hundred percent of the proposals, Josh. And I think, I think this okay. is, this is one of the big challenges, especially with web development, web design companies. You, you don't really want to hire a salesperson because you're scared to death of what they're going to create. <laughs> right? mm, that's I, a good point. I mean, I'm an engineer by, by trade. I, I know how to code. I've coded for years and I was always concerned that, you know, if I hire a non-technical salesperson, they're going to sell the $20,000 website for two grand and they're going to sell the $2,000 website for 20 grand. And either way, I'm going down to the grave early. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. I always did. But that was such a, you know, you, you start hiring people and certain things you find you can delegate. That's one thing I really struggle. How in the world am I ever going to have someone do this? And yet it takes so much time and knowledge and technical detail to do it really well. It, it was a, a formidable challenge. So I imagine you hired out the coding, development, design, it sounds like uh, initially you're doing project management, proposals, stuff like that. How long did it take for you to have an idea of productizing, particularly the proposal? Uh, I'll share it took like eight years for me to finally like stop banging my head up against the wall and just have packages and ranges, have templates and have my proposal system ready to go to where I can knock it out fairly quickly for most all of my size projects. Like how long did it take you to have the, uh, the mindset of productizing this? I think it was probably about half, half, halfway in. So about six years took me a while too. Okay. So we're not too far off. We're, we're probably bullishly, uh, cocky and confident doing our own thing until <laughs> yeah we uh get to the point where it's like all right there's got to be a better way well and what i think one thing that keeps people from productizing is if you're using something like google docs or word like that's not a system like that's not a mm -hmm. repository where i can you know start building stuff on it. it's just i've got a document i copy and paste it you know, sometimes I'll, you know, grab this proposal and because it sounds similar to this new project, I'll just duplicate that. Right. But I lost like these five things that we added to our normal template. So I'm putting it all together and I just really don't enjoy, <laughs> you know, that's, that's when the agency owner's like, 
you know, daydreaming about, you know, having a job again, or this is just, right. do I want to do my seven year, you know, uh, kind of change things up kind of thing. Was it a moment for you where did you have a proposal that took like eight hours or something? And you're like, all right, I got to change this or, or was it just a gradual collection of, you know, long discovery periods and proposals that led you to that productization idea? Well, I, I don't think that I even would have called it productization. I, I don't think I really even understood the concept. I just started kind of doing it, doing it intuitively. I'm a really big systems guy. I remember uh, I heard a, a, a kind of not not mentor, but a, a influencer that I look up to, Dan Martell. He's, he talked about, and I think he stole this quote, but um, winners and losers both have goals. So everybody has goals. Um, but winners have the systems to make the goals a reality. Um, <clears throat> that, that's, that's what gets you to the end. That's how you get there is you have to, you have to find the patterns and build systems around them. And so I just started noticing, you know, every time we do an about us page, there's like, uh, maybe a team photo, um, there, maybe they want to have a directory, listing of all their team. Um, maybe there's a pop-up where there's bios. And I just started noticing the patterns. And the, the challenge is, um, if you don't have any patterns in your business, and most, most businesses do, but if you don't have patterns, you can't um, build momentum. Um, and I didn't want, you know, just isolating that simple thing. We were doing a lot of About Us pages for different types of companies. Um, and I don't want to have to do that from scratch every single time. So we just started thinking about it more, spelling it out, creating the specific features. And then all of a sudden, without knowing it, we kind of created a product that we could sell an about us page set up. That's beautiful. So I imagine your deliverables, your line items on, on proposals, are they essentially like mini products? that you just stack on proposals? I mean, is that a simple way to think about it? Yeah, that's the way that we did it. And so over the years, you know, we, we have like a blog line item uh, where we spell out, you know, you can, it, there's, there's lots of different things that can be included in a blog, you know, related blog posts, uh, author bio pages, um, social sharing. And we started seeing those patterns and little by little, we started building them out. Um, uh, we were actually using a, a big box provider um, uh, for proposal generation. And we would just create a row in, in the pricing table on that. And we'd start to spell it out more and more. So, you know, about us page, uh, blog, uh, service page, like the services that they have, um, homepage, you know, here are the things that we generally include in a homepage so that we can have a size and scope of this, uh, maybe a contact page, right? I, I, I love looking at these things. Like, what is a contact mm -hmm. page, right? Don't just say we sell a contact page. Say, like, what actually is included. Are you going to have a Google map? Are you going to have a dynamic form? Um, are you going to, are there multiple locations? Um, does all that information need to be easily updatable? Um, do you need custom post types for locations? All that kind of stuff. And taking a second and, and really looking at what is it that we're selling here. The idea of patterns is uh, unintentionally what led me to, I guess, productize my proposal system, which I use a tool called 17 Hats. Most admin softwares have something similar where you can create a workflow to where I automated mine to where I would do the proposal after a discovery call and a little bit of a discovery period. And then that would feed right in to the contract for them to sign after accepting the proposal to the invoice and then the getting started email and then my onboarding process. And it was night and day difference in my business when I set up that workflow. But it all started with a proposal, which was always the tricky part. And what's interesting is you mentioned the pattern thing. I, for the longest time, said I could never like, and again, like you, I didn't call it productizing, but I was like, I could never have a template for a proposal because all of my websites are so different. Right. And I just kept on saying that for years, I would just do a PDF in invoice and proposal manually. And then it dawned on me with this pattern idea that I was doing a lot of products that or projects that were pretty much in the, yeah, they might have some differences and differences were typically like line items that I could add or subtract. But most of the projects were pretty, pretty much the same as I reeled in my tools and my toolbox of plugins and, and everything else. And then it dawned on me, 
I really do projects on like a small level with this type of functionality. Most of my projects are in this like mid-level type of functionality with maybe 15, 20 pages, certain functionality. And then I do some projects that are bigger and more robust in e-commerce. And every one of my leads could be filtered into those three categories. Right. And that's what helped me make those templates for my, for my proposals. Um, so I just, I don't know. I wanted to, wanted to just echo that and saying that the idea of looking out for patterns is key. So I appreciate you sharing yeah. that because I think that's a missing piece for a lot of web designers. And even if you, maybe you feel you, you, you uh, kind of resonate with the idea that all my projects are different. Okay. So yeah, maybe the exact composition, but if you look at the actual building blocks, those could be similar. Okay. Maybe this one had a blog and eight other features. And then this one had, you know, maybe there's like a 60%, you know, similarity, but there's still a lot of differences. Well, the idea is any type of service, any kind of offering, um, uh, instead of looking at each project as completely unique, look at what they're asking for and say, and say to yourself, is there something here that's repeatable that I could sell to other people? For instance, what a Salesforce integration for a contact form. Okay. Your customer asks you for that. And do you really think none of your other customers might want that? Um, or maybe integrating with some other CRM. And so you could have a special line item that ha is contact page uh, uh, and CRM integration where you spell it out. Maybe there are some pitfalls um, that you learned from the first project. Well, protect yourself in the description of that line item by you know putting a restriction on it. Like we're uh, this, this specific thing is your responsibility, not ours. And so the 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 awakening of I need to productize means that it's just slowing down and each little thing looking at it as this is this something is this a pattern that I can define and then reuse over and over. Yeah, and in the case of like an about page or a contact page, I've experienced this where. I used to treat those very different. And then inevitably I was just basically recreating the same page over and over and over on different sites. And the creative designer in me struggled with this from a prideful standpoint, because I, I felt like I was cheating if I used a saved layout from another website, or I would think that, well, if a, if a client looks at my portfolio and they see the same type of, of pages, they're going to know I'm just like, you know, taking a template and, and changing some things out. But the reality is no one does like clients are not going to look at about us pages and be like, ah, yeah, I mean, maybe they'll see a cool one that they want to mimic. But in most cases, it's not going to be like, Joe, I saw that you use the same layout yeah. on two of your projects that are on page two of your portfolio. It doesn't happen. It's like, we're in our own way. Most cases making ourselves more and more unprofitable by having like this designer pride. Whereas clients want their project done good out the door, help them grow their business. And if you can save layouts and productize the port, the, the proposal side of things, I say hats off to that. I think this is like a, um, I mean, I know there's a bit of a bit of a revolution with proposals in the agency space and, and freelancer space, but even more so, I think this is more important because it, it's easier now with AI and page builders and stuff to to do that. But I don't want people to underestimate the value of saved layouts and starting points when yeah. it comes to growing your business. Because at some point, I feel like you can't like. Uh, you tell me, Joe, you had a bigger agency than I did. Could you have built your agency to whatever level you got to without having this approach of, you know, light items that were templates and, and stuff like that? No, because everything's so unpredictable when you do that. You know, even if like, let's say you do about us page A, and then three weeks later, you do about us page B for a different prospect. Even if there's quite a bit of variance um, I agree. Your customers are likely not going to care, but even if there's uh, quite a bit of variance, so you can, f you know, scratch that designer itch. Are there still a lot of similarities, right? Maybe the layout changed quite a bit, but the code is actually very similar. Like, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you still have a staff directory, but instead of a pop-up that shows the bio info, it shows below it, right? Like the, the, when you have patterns and when you say, you know, this is kind of our base, what I can do is I can improve on that over time. And what that can do is it can actually get my effective hourly rate down. Um, I, I like, um, and when, when selling websites or services, I like the fixed bid costs because if I can optimize, I can make a higher rate. 
Um, I can make two, 300 bucks an hour and still provide incredible value. And, and sometimes even with productization, you can actually lower your prices or you can give away things for free to get the project because you know the actual hard costs and it's relatively reasonable. Yeah, it's funny. I've seen a lot of my students have an approach where if they do templated sites or like a layout based site that's already pre-built and it's more or less changing content, colors, images and stuff um, without like intensive custom design. What happens is that little like low tier offer just to get somebody started. I've seen a lot of people basically run with that and make it their main service because once you productize, baby, you don't go back. It's like, it's too good. And then the custom works like, oh, do I really need to like reinvent the wheel when I have something that works? And I think it speaks to a, a bigger issue too. And this probably comes into play with proposals where our job, I firmly believe this as web designers, our job is not to just be a task taker and pixel pusher and, and a, basically a, a an employee for a client, it's our job to show the client what works, best practices, what we know works for other clients and everything and help them basically like work within our parameters and our, in our systems. Right. At least the students that I have and what I did in my business who, and my students who are excelling at that, that is the common thread is they have, and it, this does take time often and experience to, to reel in your processes, even after going like through my courses and your proposal template and stuff like you make stuff your own, but just that idea of like, you are, you are the chef and you need to make your client's website, the meal, you know, like there's all, they could use the same tools that you're using, but you know what to do and they don't know web design like you do. So I don't know. I've just really thought about that more and more about how web designers need to be even more firm about having clients like work within their tools and processes as much as possible. I mean, there's occasional times where you might get pretty custom, but in most cases, that's just a, a recipe for disaster I've found. Right. Or unprofitability, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And think of that. I, I like this about us example that we're doing. I mean, it's, it, what's better? Create about us page for customer. OK, so that's your that's how you outlined that particular thing. Well, they have no idea what to expect. <laughs> I love the saying, if there's a, a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the congregation. <laughs> right. Like if you don't know what that freaking about us page is, I can promise you your customer doesn't. But imagine if you said something like I, I, I like to talk about the anatomy of a line item. Um, you know, you could have imagine having a line item that says about us page or about us. And then I like to start that line item with a summary sentence. Create dynamic about us page for a customer that showcases your rich talent. OK. Mm. Uh, and then I like to see some I'll say something like work included. And I'll create a bulleted list. You're taking the uh, the idea of an about us tape page and you're breaking it down into smaller ideas. Okay, so you might say work included, um, a, a mission statement on the top with staff uh, picture, um, uh, biographical uh, photos, uh, and, I, and I'm going to say I'm going to say no bios. So just just sorry, just the photos of your team, no bios. Okay, for now. And then I might say, uh, include some additional fun things about culture and ping pong tables and all that kind of stuff. Um, then I might have some upsells. Um, and part of why I created Smart Pricing Table is because I wanted software that could do all this really well. Um, but the upsell might be um, a pop-up or uh, staff bios in a pop-up. Okay, If you want that, it's an extra 250. Um, uh, integration with blog posts. Um, the ability to show blog posts um, for a staff member on the About Us page. That's an additional 150. Um, and so you start finding like, you know, your customers help you figure out more and more what one of these looks like because they'll ask for things, right? And then you're like, oh, okay, yes, that's a core piece of an About Us page. And you're yeah. always going back and you're improving your product. Sometimes you're making the base offering better. Other times you're adding a little upsell um, uh, uh, so that you're enriching it. Maybe it's that one of those things where agencies do this a lot, where you, there's two photos per staff member, this, the, the business one and then the funny one. Maybe that's an upsell. Um, and, with, and you've got some examples of other customers, uh, your customers that have done that. Uh, that's productizing, really looking at what you do. 
So let me play devil's advocate with this because I could see there being a risk of overwhelming the client if if they have to choose like every page, every section and make everything an upsell. So where's the line? Where's like the healthy balance between having an itemized proposal as detailed as possible, but also, especially with big sites, making it like digestible and pleasing for the client as a proposal. Cause like I said, I could just see, you know, if it gets too detailed, that proposal could number one be huge and it could just maybe feel a little overwhelming for the client. Yeah. Or some of this internal is, is a lot of this internal for the team. You don't, you don't want to, um, I, a lot of this, what I'm talking about is customer facing. So to answer that, um, you want to avoid two ditches. I don't want to be too vague or I'm going to create the vague vortex. I'm going to, I'm going to charge 500 bucks for that about us page. And I'm going to give them everything under the freaking sun because I just said, I'll create about us page and I had no limiters, nothing. Okay. That's the, that's one ditch. The other ditch, and I know I'm talking to some of you really engineery uh, web developers, is being so detailed that it's like obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, right? it's like a textbook. And I've yeah. seen some of those where I'm like, yes. I would not sign on this. I'm yeah. so bored and so overwhelmed looking at this thing. Yeah, you and you don't want it to go on and on and on. So, you know, you've got it. Sometimes I'll remove options because it be, seems like there's too much that I'm showing. Um, I, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have 30 additional items for them to consider. I might just have two or three. Um, you got to look at the whole proposal and the, the disposition of your customer. Some customers really, really like detail. Okay. Other customers, um, a, a proposal review meeting is a lot more important because you sense they're not going to read it or understand that stuff. Okay. Well, walk through that with them on a meeting, help them check the boxes and all that kind of stuff. But the goal is I need to establish the scope enough to define the spirit of the work, okay? If I don't have a ballpark of what the work is, then I have no handles to grab onto to say this project is done. So for, for those who would be pushed back and like, I just like it really open, okay? You cannot, when you leave it super open, you have a few different options. One, you can arbitrarily say this is done. Why? Because I said it is. <laughs> Why? Because I'm making minimum wage. Why? Uh, I, I, I need it to be done. Okay. Or you can go on forever and make, you know, you just, you, you, you play the nice agency and, you, but you know, you actually made 30 bucks an hour, which is minimum wage for an agency. Right. Um, so you, either one of those, or you can define it enough to where there's a spirit defined. You can say, look, Josh, you know, looking at this, it's kind of become a bigger thing than what we, the spirit of this. Um, and we actually had a max of 10 hours. How about I give you two extra hours? But honestly, after that, we're just going to have to go hourly. That's way better than arbitrarily. Sorry, we just got to stop. What? Oh, no, you're fine. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's so much better than telling them that we're just killing this. Um, no, I to yeah. I totally get that. I think that's sound advice, particularly I like that thought of basing it off of like having a couple options and basing it off of the client for those who are really detailed and the bean counters who want to see everything you're doing. I had some clients who were like, as long as it's within this range, we're good. Let's go. So the detail would be a little more internal for me, um, right. for, for me personally and for my team. I think that's a really good approach. I like that idea. You mentioned uh, bullet points. I love bullet points. And I've found clients love bullet points. What is your, I mean, I, I so I have not personally gone through your guide, but I, I've looked through your site and I see that your proposal system is really similar to what I've created in, in 17 hats, which is text-based, uh, like bulletproof based, or excuse me, bullet point based. I've seen a lot of agency proposals that are essentially PDF websites. And I know they work for some people. I was always very against that though, because in my mind, in most cases, and, and maybe that's a little more accepted for RFPs, like requests for proposals, where they don't really know you very well. So a, a, a proposal PDF is kind of like a sales website brochure. But for most of my clients, they've already viewed my website. They already know, like, and trust me, hopefully. They just want to know what are the goals? What are the deliverables? What's the price? 
let's go or yeah. not go. Is that fair to say that that's kind of your approach even with yeah. this product? Test? Yeah. Yeah. And when I originally, so I was using, again, a big box provider to create proposals. And what I, what frustrated about me about it was it took so long for me to duplicate my template proposal and to modify things. Like I'm not kidding, mm. like, like 30, 60 seconds to open a proposal. As a sales guy at a small mm -hmm. agency, I had a lot going on. Like, I don't have time for that, you know? And, and what, that's just because it was such a big document, like with yeah, so many pages and graphics and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and a lot of times, so my product is actually focused on digital agencies and marketing companies. And so we don't have a thousand features that are not relevant to that niche. Um, the product I was using is for any proposal under the sun for any industry. And so there's just all this extra overhead that really slowed the, slowed the product down. And I kept thinking, Josh, all that changes on our projects generally, like the 90% of what changes is our service offering and our price. Mm -hmm. I wish that I had a scope of work creator tool uh, that I could then maybe put back into the system that we're using. And gotcha. that was the genesis for I idea is I wanted to build a solid scope of work very easily. And I wanted, instead of it being like this hazy, foggy experience, I just wanted to add building blocks together and tweak. Every project's different, so you need to be tweak them, but building blocks and tweak. And then we ended up creating Smart Pricing Table. It wasn't called that six years ago. It was just for my own agency. Um, and we... You know, after we got the scope of work working, we just decided to finish the thought. And so we made it a full, that's system, how the, full system. That's how the best tools are made right there, right? You build something for yourself when it's not out there and then suddenly everyone else wants it. So yeah. I love that Genesis story of that. Have you found like some, in some ways, I feel like the freelancer world, which is largely what I was and what, even as an, an agency owner, right? I never called myself an agency. I was much more of like a studio basically, um, I always felt like there was a big disconnect or difference at least between full agency owners and freelancers, but I don't know if that's the case for clients, especially in the way of proposals. Cause like I said, the agencies that I knew a couple guys I knew in that those agencies, they would show me their proposals and I'm like, good Lord, it's like a 23 page website brochure that is like a, it's basically a graphically designed like brochure for every right. proposal. I'm like, I just can't imagine doing that at my level and with the clients that I work with. Um, is that commonplace with agency clients or is the line blurred between freelancers and agencies with, with what proposals look like and what works? I think it's a natural development, right? So at an agency, you're going to have a lot more resources and more time. That said, that said, I think using Canva or InDesign for proposals is just a horrible idea. You cannot scale that. You can't systematize that and you can't error proof it very easily. Um, so that's that, uh, more complex proposals are obviously more commonplace in the agency world, but with freelancers, I think the challenge is just time. You know, you're mm -hmm. a lot of times you're doing the work, you're hunting for new work, but, um, you know, imagine as a freelancer, if you could just have a simple proposal template, with a cover page, your terms, and you're adding new terms. I like just always continuous improvement, always learning. Add new terms, have a place where your terms actually live in a proposal template, and then a simple catalog of what you offer. As a freelancer, it's some in some ways even more important that you know what you do. You have to build momentum with because you you, you can't do a million things. You you have to say you know I generally want to do the like these five things. Um, and, and really scope them out in a reusable way. Um, but it doesn't, you know, you're, you're not going to have a, an about us page. You're not going to have a, a page dedicated to your insurance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These 10 policies we have because you do government work or whatever, like it can be a lot simpler, but that doesn't mean you can't build a system. The system is actually what's going to help you have an enjoyable freelance and then possibly leave you some room to, to hire. Yeah. I was wondering with in the agency world, if there were, if it was just more commonplace, essentially to have a more complex graphic designed, big brochure style proposal template. Whereas again, in the freelance world, personally, I just found my clients loved it. It was like I said earlier, it was easy to, they already knew me. So it was just, here's the goals, here's the right. deliverables, here's the price. Let's freaking go. 
Um, and a lot of clients appreciate that. I actually had some tell me like, this was so much easier to get going with. We've talked to the agencies and it was like the hurdles and it was just so much that went into it, which I can understand if it's like a massive project, that's going to be a lot of man hours and a lot of complex parts to it. But for most small businesses, most websites aren't that complex, especially with the tools we have now. So, right. yeah, I really like that idea. What about, um, I don't know. Do you feel like there is a, a movement towards more simplistic proposals in particular? Do you feel like, cause I always wondered, are my proposals like old school or unprofessional or if they're just text and bullet points or, or should I go that route of having like well-designed graphics for every, every part? Like, do you think, I guess the question is, do you think like the simple bullet point kind of approach is more or less professional or, or is that not even anything we need to worry about? When I think of proposals, I think of two ideas, uh, the sizzle and the steak. Now, a lot of, a lot of freelancers or real small shops, they're not going to have as much sizzle. And I would argue that that's okay. And your prospects probably talking to you because they know that you have a price advantage. Okay. But the, the, the steak is your scope of work. It's your terms. It's your t project timeline. It's the, it's the rules of the game and the basic data that is fundamental to a successful project. Your sizzle is all the awards, your team, uh, your uh, you know hum humanitarian efforts, um, your case studies, your testimonials, and I honestly I think that can be those those can be separate. Like your scope of work, you might create in a, a tool. Like your your proposal is focused mostly on that, and then you have a brochure that you send along um, uh, that has some of that wow factor. Um, I, I just don't, I I'd say de on your, depending on the space you're in, if you're, if you're five people or less like agency or you're a freelancer, I think just keep it really simple. Customers aren't stupid. They get it. There's a reason why I'm going with you. It's because I don't have $50,000 for a website, right? I have 15,000 and, and I think there can be a real appreciation of here are the terms and here's the prices. Here are the rules of the game. Now, spice it up a little bit. Don't do a wall of text. Break things down with bulleted lists, with line items. Like Break down the work so it's not overwhelming. And then have a picture of your face so it's not anonymous. But it doesn't have to be crazy. Um, we actually have some sample templates uh, that kind of show this on our website um, with some of these basic pages. I love that analogy of the sizzle and steak approach. And I totally agree. I mean, it kind of... What I tried to articulate earlier is really what you just did much better, which is your website is the sizzle. That's where you have all the awards, the information, the fun stuff, the graphics, the, everything. But the stake is, yeah, it's the terms, it's the details, it's the deliverables. And again, the only time I would say where that changes is if you're sending in a proposal or a quote for an organization that does not know you personally yet. And it's kind of you know, one, but I like that approach of having it in a brochure form as an, as an add-on or an addition to that, that because it does get muddied. A lot of people like how, let's say this, this potential client for like a board or something has 20 proposals to look at and all of them are 30 pages. My God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm stressed out thinking about that. You know, if there is one of those proposals that was really clear and by the way, if you want to know more about us, here's our brochure. In my mind, that's the way to go in those complex, big projects types. Yeah. And you have to you have to recognize that a lot of times the prospects that you're talking to have multiple vendors and like ha having them to have to do so much work. I just having to scroll over and over and over to find the freaking price so that I can do an apples right. to apples comparison. I mean, I, one, of, one of the things that I, I saw at our agency is people loved the clarity that we had, they, they love the detail and they love the optionality. Um, uh, and, and so keeping it somewhat simple and allowing them to see the price and then to have input, we could talk about this as another topic, but optionality is huge. Um, I, I think keep, keeping it simple is, is a big win. Um, and, and then iterating as you get feedback from your customers. Well, the optionality thing might be kind of interesting because one thing I was curious about from your perspective is how many conversations are you having 
How long is the process before you get to a point where you understand the scope well enough to make it a proposal? Or is the proposal dictating the scope of the project for the client in some ways? Like how for, I mean, probably tough to average out exactly, but um, how, how did that process work leading up to the proposal to where you're like, okay, we've got a good idea of the scope. We can make this proposal. Well, if, if you remember what you said, Josh, that part of your job is to be the consultant and to lead, right? You're not just saying, what do you want? You're saying, well, here's actually what you should consider. Um, then uh, th this is not a terribly hard process. So the way that I, I've done things historically is I'd have a sales discovery call, um, 30 minutes to an hour, and I would try to get a bunch of information. Because I have because I know I'm also the coach, I'm consulting them. I don't worry about getting every freaking detail perfect. Okay. So I'm just kind of trying to get the information. Um, and, and knowing that I can add options to the proposal so that they can decide on things that are blurry right now makes it so that that meeting doesn't have to be two hours. Oh, you, you might be interested in that. Okay. Good to know. All right. I'll include that. I just have to push a button. I'll include that. Um, nice. then what I would do is after that sales discovery call, I would, uh, generally require a proposal review meeting. Um, I would schedule a proposal. I'd say something like, um, you know, Josh, thanks for downloading all that information. The next step in our process is I'd like to schedule a proposal review meeting. I bring up my calendar. I'd book it with you right there because I want the opportunity um, to um, sell my proposal. I don't want you asking questions by yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I want you asking questions out loud with me on the Zoom so that I can answer them. Um, okay, so I, I, I took a little... That's little, great. Real quick. I want to hang on to just for a sec. That's a genius way to go about that. I've never really heard a frame like that. So a proposal review meeting. And you do that on the sale the discovery call. So before they even get a quote, they know we're going to talk about this together. Yeah. And and Josh, if they say they're they're not willing to give you 20 more minutes, what does that tell you? Mm, yeah. Right. So it's also it's kind of a test of how serious they are. If they're just trying to check the box that I got 15 proposals, that's not the kind of company I want to put a lot of time into. Maybe if that's the case, um, if they're, they're if they're not willing to meet with me, maybe I only spend 20 minutes on the proposal and I chuck it over the fence. And I've had those turn out to be a big deal. Right. Um, but generally, I want to have a proposal review meeting um, so that. Uh, I can I can show more of myself. I can show more of my company and the way that we think, and I can win win their hearts and minds into the way that I do business. I love that approach, man. That's genius. And look, the really cool thing about this is for freelancers and small agencies, you're not doing that many of these. I've I've said it for a long time. Like as a web designer, the beauty nowadays is I've found businesses are looking for their trusted like web person or web partner. And Yes, you should productize as much as you can, but this isn't something unless you're at such a high scale that you're doing multiple ones of these a week, like that follow-up call, maybe you're doing that twice a month or three times a month. Very doable, very achievable. Like it's not like you're doing this, you know, five, six times a week, uh, especially at high price ranges. One client a month might be fine for a lot of freelancers. So right. um, all that to say, that's a great way to go about that. I love that framework. Yeah. Yeah. You had an original question and I, then I got a squirrel syndrome and started talking about the proposal review meeting. Um, I, I'm lost on what the original one was. <laughs> well, that makes two of us. I don't remember either. I'm so fascinated <laughs> we... by this proposal follow-up. I love that. I, now I want to hang on that because it's so great. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, oh, oh, the original question was the, uh, the scope, like how long, Oh yeah, yeah. How yeah, yeah. long it takes to feel good about the proposal? But I think you kind of answered it by saying, like, you, you probably don't need that much, and then you guide the client to the constraints of your processes. Yeah. I would imagine, unless yeah. there's more to that. Let me finish the thought on that. So, so then you create the proposal, but because you've actually over time established what you do and what you sell, um, you you start you know adding line items to the proposal, um, and then you tweak them as needed. Um, and what I love about options is options cut down on back and forth, and it makes it so that if there's a question, did they want Salesforce integration? I don't, I don't have to know that if I make mm. an option and it doesn't have to slow down my close process, process right? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I'll tell you what, if you want to close faster, uh, well, three things, one, build a system and check out smart pricing table. Okay. Build a system. 
uh, shameless plug. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, have a proposal review meeting so that you can sell your your cus uh, customer. Um, and I actually have a video on this that I could share with folks if they reach out to me. Um, and the, th the third one is uh, add optionality. And because uh, the proposal review meeting, you're going over so many questions, you're answering so many things that would normally be in an email with a bulleted list of the endless questions. And then the optionality is allowing them to make some decisions on your on their side without you. They don't need an option or a version two, version three of your proposal because your the options give them that. I found that when we started doing all that kind of stuff, um, it just absolutely revolutionized uh, our close rate and just the enjoyability of the process. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I, optionality is cool too because, yeah, number one, you don't need to get everything out in the discovery call. We've all had those situations where we did a proposal and then the project's going and they're like, oh, we wanted the blog. Didn't we talk about that? And you're like, ah, now we got to go back and do another retainer of hours or whatever it is. Or you feel like, ah, crap, did we talk about that? We may have, but I forgot. The option thing is great because, yeah, it's, it, it really works to like to cover you as a web designer with scope, but also give the ability for upsells. And I imagine that's how you could take a project from 5,000 to 10,000 pretty quick. If you have some upsells that they're like, Oh yeah, we do want some lead generators and we do want to connect it. We do want a blog and we do want this and this and this, and we do want some additional functionality that we didn't talk about. So I think it's a really, really smart way to go. The other thing about that too, is I was thinking, I was just envisioning this and I imagine you could have some add-ons that are based off of the tools that you use, like integrating with Salesforce or MailChimp or whatever it is. But then maybe if they have their own thing going on, you could have like a, would you recommend having an, an add-on or an option for like a custom approach that would then lead maybe to another conversation or lead to a book of hours? I guess the question is like, what if there's something that's not covered in those options? I, I always included something, a little section called additional items for consideration. I would generally put three or four items in there. So I don't want to overwhelm them. Um, uh, but three or four items based on the sales call and my intuition. And uh, so what, one of those might be like an ongoing retainer. Are you offering that to every customer? Maybe you forgot to mention it and they could have, they would have done it, right? Um, another, uh, they, it, maybe it's a competitive audit. Uh, maybe it's a one-time block of hours for unforeseen things. Maybe it's a, um, uh, maybe they didn't want a blog or we didn't talk about a blog because we didn't have time. And you add that to additional items for consideration. I cannot tell you how many times people will click on things that you don't even know they wanted. Um, mm, yeah. If you're, if you're going to bring food to a party, you best well put, you, you better put the food on the table, take the wrapper off and put a spoon in it. Okay. If you don't do that, they're going to think it's for a different party, even though it's on the table. Okay. Okay. Simple concept. You just got to put it on the table though. It, so with, with a, you don't assume that you're, you don't have services that your customer is interested in that you haven't talked about. And because if you, if you treat your uh, scope of work as somewhat of a mini brochure, a catalog as well, you'd be surprised at how many times they, they click that button. That's so well said, man. I'm glad we're doing this after lunch too, because that would have made me hungry. That, yeah, I, I love that now. It's true. Like, I, this is it's funny. It's one of the main things as a coach now that I talk to a lot of my students about, which is, do your clients know what you do and like all the other services you offer? Because they would probably buy from you, like a large percentage would buy from you again over and over and over without you even having to go get new clients all the time. You just got to let them know. And you got to make it available for them. And actually, I'm reminded of doing this all the time too, even with what I do now. I'm like, somebody new getting into my brand today isn't just going to magically know about all the courses I offer, exactly how I help, what stage they're at, and how I can help with where they're at. So it's my job and us as everyone as web designers to be really, really transparent about what you do, how you help all the time. Like I, I'm just reminded of this like, almost every week. Now I think about this where it's like, we should not be shy about having those additional options front and center. Uh, and it's funny, practically, I remember thinking that you said like, you might just think, well, all clients are, aren't going to want these extra services. Well, I had that mindset for a long time. You, 
finding out how many mindset barriers I had to get through to make a prof- profitable six figure business. One of them was I would do basic SEO, just foundational best practice SEO on websites. And I had this little SEO booster program called SEO Boost that just, I was thinking like maybe some clients would like that. It involved keyword research for between five, 10 and 15 pages. Uh, Just basic, some ongoing SEO was just a boost. It was like an SEO boost for the big pages of the site. I thought maybe a couple clients would like that. That became my number one add-on that like 90% of clients use. And it was a $500 to $1,500 boost per program. And for me at the time, that was a huge revenue boost for me. And it was all with this mindset of just having an add-on and finding out, wow, a lot of clients were really interested in this upsell. And they would have never done it if I didn't make it front and center. It, it's amazing how, how how many times we're just wrong with our intuition, right? Like let your customer <laughs> tell you if you're wrong. Um, and, and I think it's just back to productization for the win again, because, you know, Josh, not only uh, could that be a great offering for you, but you can specify the rules of the game. You can make it really clear so that it's always a win for you. I, yeah. I, I know as an agency owner, I would always think like, I don't like that work. That, that's not very fun. But when I actually start asking questions, the reason why I don't like that work is because I haven't defined it and I'm not charging the right price, or maybe I need to take something out so that it's at a good price point. And then, then it's like, all of a sudden, this is fantastic. Let's start selling this to everyone. Um, And it's just incredible. When your prospect checks that box and they add $3,000 to your project, they own that $3,000. If you had to sell it to them, you're a salesperson. But when they click it, right? It's totally different. There's ownership. They take responsibility. If there's challenges, see, yeah. if, if there's challenges down the road, like they're like, well, we wanted to do this, right? Um, huge. Great then, mindset shift as opposed to being like, okay, this project's $5,000. Do you accept it? And they're like, okay, I accept. Whereas yeah, $5,000 of extras that they chose totally different feeling for them. And I imagine if they choose it, they may feel a little more like, all right, you've got this, you've got a template, you know, what works that mm-hmm. and even, even just basic principles of a proposal, if it's in line items and bullet points and everything else, it feels like, okay, they know what they're doing. I'm going to have my input, but it, wow, that, that, uh, mindset of ownership is interesting. Yeah. If yeah. They choose it. I like that. And, and people can, I, I don't, you tell me if we're getting short on time here, Josh, but I, I, optionality, another, another facet of this is um, people get concerned, like if I get, create some optionality, what if someone turns something off? Okay, well, don't, if it, first off, don't let it be a vital thing. If, it, if it's vital, they shouldn't be able to turn it off. Gotcha. But I always say, I would rather have 100% of a $10,000 project than 0% of a 12,000 because I was over budget, right? So mm, they de okay. some things. They, I didn't have to give a discount to get down to 10K, but they descoped a few things by de- deselecting things on my bid. And then they got to 10 and it totally worked, right? I'd rather, I'd rather have that. But what generally happens is when you start giving options, um, like increases like 20, 30, 40% higher project values over, over time. That was my experience. It's, it's well, usually the other way. I have a... Very, very real story about this. When my wife and I built and moved into our new home, we we built this home a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, like we went in with a budget in mind and went out like $100,000 over budget because of all the options that we just decided to add on and didn't want to live without. So it's like everything. I mean, we've all been in those sales processes. I think the home building process was one where it was like, you know, we expected some we expected some additional items, but then we got into them. We're like, well, of course we want that. Yeah, I want that. For web designers and clients, it's like, oh, yeah, I want SEO boost. Why wouldn't I? Uh, yeah, I want this. It is a way, and it's not like nickel and diming people, but it is a way to provide value up front for clients. And honestly, a lot of clients are willing to spend way more if they understand the value than if you were to just send a flat proposal over for 5,000, fingers crossed, mm-hmm. and then hope they don't ghost you. So a lot of this, I think, is going to help a lot of people with, with the proposal process. Like yeah. That. O- options equal FOMO. Ah, uh, that's good. Good quote. Quote it. When you put, yeah, write it down. Options equal FOMO. When you put it in there, they, they see it and they're like, oh, we want that. Cred, cred. You know, we said $15,000 budget, but we can do 17, right? <laughs> so very, very I love powerful. That. 
I love that. It's funny. I've had that thought with like my, my checkout page for my courses and stuff really working on, uh, yeah, like additional product, the upsells without being overly in your face and salesy, but if it's valuable and if it, like in my world with courses, it's like, if you're going to get my business course, my maintenance plan course is a necessity to go alongside that. Um, that's kind of something I'm working on now. So thank you, Joe, for adding my to-do list because I need to get that going stat. Uh, that's a great quote though. Uh, what was it? Optionality equals FOMO or options yep. equal FOMO? Yep. Yep. Okay. Options equal FOMO. That's good, man. Well, dude, this has been great. A lot of good stuff covered here. Proposals fascinate me because there's just, there's not a right or wrong with it, but there's definitely better practices than others. You definitely as an agency owner have the experience that is real world based and you have a great tool. So yeah, tell us about your tool and then uh, subsequently maybe where somebody should go to, to find out more about that and connect with you. Yeah, well, Smart Pricing Table is interactive proposal software that allows you to create a killer catalog with clear definitions and upsells on the line item level. I don't know of any other software that allows configurations on line items. Mm -hmm. um, if, if these uh, principles that Josh and I are talking about are interesting, I would encourage you to check out smartpricingtable.com. Uh, two things. Number one, uh, we have free demos. Um, I actually meet with you myself, and I'd love to see if the product could be a fit, even if it's a bit of tire kicking. And the second thing is uh, we have um, proposal samples and a free guide, uh, the Profitable Proposal Blueprint. Um, and so I, I check out those things. I'm also big on LinkedIn. But you know, a big thing about, over all of this is um, the software can help you build a system. And when you have a system, you can make improvements. You cannot make improvements when you don't have a system. You can't build momentum. And I was so, I just, I saw how much this did for our agency that I thought I've got to give this to other people. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we end up taking it to the market. That's great, man. I know. I love what you're up to. I think it's a really, really cool system. I'm glad to have this in my back pocket now because it's, it's kind of the next level of what I use and what I teach on. I have, a, I have essentially a simplified version of this. The add-ons and upsells were just a little bit different, but this is definitely kind of the full, it looks like it's the full kit and caboodle would be able to, to really package this up and productize it nicely. So yeah, man, we'll definitely have that in the show notes, smartpricingtable.com and in your free guide. Definitely going to recommend everyone check that out. Um, so yeah, man, Joe, thank you for your time. This has been a fun chat, man. We finally, we made it work. We're both family men with a lot of little kids. We had a couple of reschedules, but, uh, we made it work and, uh, yeah, this was cool, man. I really enjoyed hearing your process. I appreciate you sharing today. Likewise, Josh. Thanks for having me on your show, man. Awesome. Cheers, man. So there we are friends. Is it, are you pumped to do your next proposal? Because this conversation, I mean, we've talked about proposals a lot on the podcast, but every time I talk about a proposal with somebody new. It's fun because I always learn something. There's always a fresh perspective. And one thing I took away from this conversation truly was the optionality and how important that is to be able to upsell to your clients and help them understand the value. And again, I said in the intro, potentially two to three X your projects right from the get go with just these different options. So if you're looking for a tool, that is going to help you with this functionality and the optionality for your proposals. I really do highly recommend smart pricing table. You can check a lot of things out for free. Joe's got a free guide for you and some free samples. You can go to my link, joshhall.co slash SPT. That's short for smart pricing table. And you'll be able to get a free demo and check it out. See if it's a good fit for you in your business because I really, really want to make your life easier with proposals. There's nothing worse than wanting to grow your business and wanting to get new clients, but then not wanting to do proposals because that's how you do all that. So this is going to help you out. And I'm really excited to help you out. And I hope this conversation helped you too. It really proposals don't need to be rocket science. They don't need to be something overwhelming. Um, again, they can be quick, they can be fun. And at the, at the end of the day, it's what's the, it's the bridge between you and landing a client is your proposal. So my gosh, it's important. No pressure, but it is important. All right, friends. Again, use my link, joshhall.co slash SPT. That'll zip you over to smartpricingtable.com to do a free trial and to check it out. All right, friends. Talk with you soon.